Today, first hour, I'm bringing uh, the second half of the two-part message refuting the bizarre and rather occultic religion of Mormonism, which, though like Roman Catholicism, claims to be the true Christian religion in the earth today, as we'll see highlighted in today's message, the Mormon religion bears no similarity whatsoever to the true Christian faith established by the Lord Jesus Christ and his apostles and as recorded in God's faithful word, the King James Bible, and is in fact far more an adaptation and very close imitation actually of occultic Freemasonry than it is of the biblical Christian faith. And for those hearing the message online, if you've not already heard part one, I would strongly urge you to do so before you hear today's message. And I repeat that I am challenging all Mormons who believe that Joseph Smith was a true prophet of God to please hear the message and to take to heart and to prayerfully consider the evidence that we are presenting that has led, actually, many former Mormons to see that Joseph Smith was no prophet of God, but that he was instead a fraud and a charlatan who allowed himself to be used by Lucifer, the devil himself, to launch a satanic attack against the true Christian faith. And so I would just urge Mormons today to please hear the evidence and consider that you have been victimized by a satanic deception that may cost you your very soul. Last time, in part one of the message, I gave a general overview of the rather interesting and somewhat dramatic history of the rise of Mormonism, which, much like the false religion of Islam's false prophet Muhammad, is based on alleged visions and angelic visitations claimed to have been experienced by a young man named Joseph Smith, Jr., Smith, if you remember, had been raised in a family of mystics who were actively involved in occultic Freemasonry and the practice of folk magic and enchantments and divination, all of which we know is flatly condemned in Deuteronomy 18, verse 10 to 12, where God says all that do these things are an abomination to the Lord. But that actually appears to be the primary method uh, for Smith's so-called translation of the Book of Mormon from some alleged golden plates, if you recall, that Smith allegedly received from an angel named Moroni. Smith claimed that he had translated the book by the gift and power of God, when in fact it was a product of the same occultic folk magic and divination practices that Smith had learned from his family. And using the same seer stone placed in the stovepipe top hat that just a few years before got Smith arrested and convicted of fraud for treasure hunting. So that is the source of the Book of Mormon. We gave an overview of the storyline of Smith's Book of Mormon last time of an ancient migration of Jews from Israel to the Americas in 600 B.C. who quickly reproduced in superhuman population explosion fashion to expand into two separate tribes and civilizations known as the Lamanites and Nephites that were at constant war with each other except for a brief time of peace brought about by the Lord Jesus himself when he allegedly visited them after his resurrection. And we made note of the book's many historical impossibilities that show it to be a fictional fabrication of Joseph Smith's invention. Such impossibilities in the Book of Mormon included the aforementioned impossible uh, population explosion over just a few decades, included Smith's allegation that the Jews that migrated from Israel spoke Egyptian rather than Hebrew, included Smith's writing of several species of plants and animals that he claimed to have existed in America at the time of the alleged migration that did not exist on the continent until they were introduced by the European immigrants over 2,000 years later, along with the book's contention that dark skin is a curse resulting from a disobedience to the Mormon gospel and that the American Indians descended from the Lamanite Hebrew settlers, which modern DNA science has proven to be false, and that Hebrew migrants to America built two flourishing civilizations that allegedly covered the whole face of the land with buildings. And while scores of archaeological finds, by the way, have been unearthed in Israel and surrounding regions proving the Bible to be true, for the last century and a half, several generations of devout Mormons and Mormon scholars have searched in vain for archaeological evidence in support of the Book of Mormon. I mentioned last time Brigham Young University professor Thomas Stewart Ferguson, who founded BYU's Department of Archaeology and devoted his life to proving the Book of Mormon to be true. But then after 25 years of dedicated research, not one shred of archaeological evidence was ever found 
to back up the geography, peoples, coins, or settlements of the book. And therefore, Ferguson himself concluded the Book of Mormon to be fictional. Because of which I'd add also that Mormonism's Brigham Young University no longer even has a Department of Archaeology. They changed the name of the department to the Department of Anthropology now. I also mentioned a noted Mormon scholar named B.H. Roberts, who was a general authority in the Mormon church and came to the same conclusion. And after explaining at length in a 400-page manuscript the impossibilities in the Book of Mormon, he also said that he had discovered Joseph Smith did have a number of books that could have assisted him and given him ideas for the Book of Mormon, which then debunks the common Mormon claim that the Book of Mormon is a miraculous book that could not have been conceived by a mere mortal. As also mentioned last time, though Joseph Smith said the Book of Mormon is the most correct book of any on earth, and though it's regarded by faithful, uninformed, and unsuspecting Mormons as true history, the fact is that the Book of Mormon contains obvious historical and factual impossibilities. Yet, despite its obvious problems, it is still used by Mormons today as their first introductory tool that they hand out by the millions to induct unsuspecting proselytes into the cult, often asking them just to start reading and pray and see if they think it's God's word. Just pray and see what you feel about it. Which is precisely why I began part one of this message with God's words in Isaiah chapter one, where the Lord says, come now and let us reason together. And by stating that the true God of the Bible has never asked a man to put his brain and his intellect and his ability to reason on the shelf in order to believe ridiculous or absurd things alleged about him that are in any way disproven by the facts of true science and history. And also that while the Bible is neither a history nor a science textbook, nowhere does God's infallible word, the Bible, conflict with true science or with true history and archaeology. And contrary to the Book of Mormon, with its multiple historical and factual impossibilities, as stated, the historical accounts and prophecies of the Bible have been proven over and over again to be true by multiplied hundreds of archaeological findings and other historical sources. And so then after that brief review, picking up where we left off last time, I want to add some more historical evidence also that further shows Joseph Smith to be an absolute fraud and a charlatan. And this has to do with his claim regarding the first alleged visitation that he claimed to have received from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ in 1820 when he would have been only 14 years old. If you'll recall from part one, Joseph Smith never even recorded that first alleged visitation where he said that God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ appeared to him. He never recorded that at all until 1842 when he wrote the Wentworth letter to the editor of the Chicago Democrat newspaper, wherein he outlined the history of the LDS movement. And again, then that letter was later incorporated into the Joseph Smith history section of the Pearl of Great Price when it was first published in 1851. However, documented historical evidence proves that Smith's alleged visitation from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ never actually took place. And that was actually another of Joseph Smith's very tall tales. Joseph Smith claimed in his letter uh, that after he had seen a vision of God the Father in Jesus Christ, he told it first to a Methodist preacher, and that it started the entire community there in Palmyra, New York, all men of high standing and the great ones of the most popular sects, wrote Smith, to persecute him bitterly as just a 14-year-old boy. And if that was true, we'd expect to see that someone at that time would have written about such an event that caused all the men of high standing and the great ones of the most popular sects to persecute this young 14-year-old youth. And many less important events and even unimportant gossip was printed that you can go back and find the records of. But there is no such record of any occurrence anywhere in the written records of that town. And there's also no record of the alleged revival excitement that Smith also claimed was the reason why he went out to the grove there to seek God in prayer when the Lord Jesus and God the Father allegedly appeared to him, where he received this fantastic vision. And then also, Smith said in the letter 
that he was told twice in this alleged vision not to join any of the local religions or churches. However, local records do also show that in 1823, Joseph's mother, sister, and two brothers joined the local Presbyterian church. They apparently didn't believe his story. That was uh, three years after he allegedly had that vision. And then later, Joseph himself actually sought membership in the Methodist church where his wife was a member. The records then show that Smith was actually expelled from that church in 1828 because of his belief in magic and also because of his, quote, money digging activities that he had also been, as we talked about, he'd also been prosecuted for in court. And that fact in itself by, and by itself would seem to prove either one or two things. It's either that Joseph Smith, an alleged prophet of God, either he rebelliously disobeyed a direct command uh, that allegedly proceeded from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ as they appeared to him in a grove. Or else it proves that Smith's claim 22 years later in the Wentworth letter was an absolute lie. And God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ never appeared to him in the first place. And that latter conclusion that the event never happened is also proven by other evidence as well. Smith's newly organized LDS church started to publish its history via a couple of different publications, one of which was called The Messenger and the Advocate. Smith's cohort, Oliver Cowdery, was the main editor of that publication. And the publication was also overseen, of course, by Joseph Smith himself. In volume one, on page 79 of that publication, Joseph Smith relates that after his brother Alvin's death, and after his mother, sister, and two brothers then joined the Presbyterian church, Joseph Smith started to seek religion then at that point in time and to pray if some supreme being existed. And that was after this alleged visitation would have occurred. However, of course, if Smith had had a vision of God the Father and his son, Jesus Christ, in 1820, he most certainly would, would have known by 1823 or 1824 that a supreme being existed. And so, in searching through diaries, records, newspapers, etc., one seeks in vain to try to find any mention of Smith's so-called first vision until 1842, 22 years after this alleged vision took place. And so clearly, the entire story of this first alleged vision upon which the entire Mormon religion is based, basically, the entire thing was an afterthought, created after Smith's doctrine had changed, actually, after the vision story, since the vision story that he was given talks about two separate gods, the, the Book of Mormon says that there is only one God, and that Jesus, God the Father and the Holy Ghost, are this one God. That's in Alma chapter 11, chapter 18, and Mosiah chapter 15 of the Book of Mormon. He talks about the, the Trinity there, but his vision story talks about these being his two separate gods. And therefore, there is absolutely no evidence for the first vision as it appears in the Pearl of Great Price, or that the vision was known to Mormons or non-Mormons prior to 1842 or thereabouts. It wasn't even known until then. And actually, it wasn't until the 1880s that this story was even accepted by the church as doctrine. Prior to that time, all that you can find are claims denying it, denying that it happened. For one example, in the Journal of Discourses, is included a sermon preached by Brigham Young in 1855, in which Brigham Young said this, The Lord did not come to Joseph Smith, but sent his angel to inform him that he should not join any religious sect of the day, for they were all wrong. Another Mormon leader, John Taylor, said the same thing. In Journal of Discourses, chapter 20, on March 2nd, 1879, also Heber Kimball said the same. In Journal of Discourses, chapter 6, he said, Do you suppose that God in person called upon Joseph Smith, our prophet? God called upon him, but did not come himself. So they're all contradicting each other here. And so all these things combined, Smith joining his wife, Methodist Church, after allegedly being forbidden to do so, no local record supporting the story, not one shred of writing by Joseph Smith about the event until 1842. Smith's question of even whether some supreme being existed after he allegedly had this vision, and all the denials by early Mormon writers, all of these things taken together should serve as undeniable proof that Smith's story of the event that started it all, the very bedrock foundation actually for the entire religion of Mormonism 
of the alleged appearance by God the Father and Lord Jesus Christ to Joseph Smith in 1820 never actually happened. And the whole thing, the whole story is a lie. Which, of course, therefore also shows that Joseph Smith himself was a liar, a fraud, and a charlatan, which then, of course, shows the entire religion of Mormonism to be a lie. As stated also, though, although the Book of Mormon is not really that much a departure from biblical Christianity and doctrine and theology, from the time the cult of Mormonism was formed in about 1828 and the Book of Mormon printed in 1830 until Joseph Smith's untimely death in 1844, Smith's doctrine changed drastically. And Mormonism's more bizarre and satanic doctrines developed later as Smith allegedly received additional revelations as recorded in his later writings, which were then incorporated into the Doctrine and Covenants book and also the Pearl Great Price, both of which they regard as scripture. It was not until 1844 that Smith started to preach about this God who was once a man and progressed into Godhood and how men can also become gods. So as a result, there are many, many of what should be considered very embarrassing contradictions between the Book of Mormon and what is accepted today as fundamental Mormon theology, doctrine, and practice, which is what we need to talk about next. What do Mormons believe about God? First, as for doctrinal authority, the LDS Church's beliefs are based on the doctrine of continual revelation, which states, quote, We believe all God has revealed, all that he does now reveal, and we believe that he will yet reveal many great and important things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Let me restate that. We believe all that God has revealed, all that he does now reveal, and we believe that he will yet reveal many great and important things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So it continues to give additional revelation. However, they do believe that the only one who is authorized to bring forth new doctrine is the president of the church, who, when he does, will declare it as a revelation from God, and it will then be accepted by the church's first presidency and the quorum of the twelve apostles that they call them, and then sustained by the body of the church. Secondly, then, doctrinally, Mormons deny the biblical doctrine of the Trinity. They deny a triune God who exists as three separate persons united into one Godhead, as the Bible teaches. They instead believe that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are three separate gods. They believe also that the Father and Son each have a body of flesh and bones as tangible as man's, but that the Holy Ghost has not a body of flesh and bones, but is a personage of spirit. According to Joseph Smith, when Adam was formed in the image of God, it was a physical image. God the Father was once a mortal who lived on earth. He died, he was resurrected, he glorified, he grew into deified status, he became a God. Smith also taught later in his apostasy that there is a God above the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God the Father is the literal father of all spirit children, they taught. He's the literal father of all spirit children. He has a spirit mother as well. He is the literal father of all spirit children, including Jesus and the Holy Ghost, whose divinity is derived from that parent-child relationship. It is devilish. It's satanic. Amen. The LDS teaches that all the father's children, including humans, possess the same potential to become gods, uh, like the father, Jesus, and the Holy Ghost, since they are of the same species. That's what they teach. They teach that every human spirit once existed as a divine intelligence before becoming the spirit children of the Father. Prior to creation, human spirits were literal children of heavenly parents. Although their spirits were created, their essential intelligence of uh, these spirits is considered eternal and without beginning. They believe that at a family council, God the Father told the spirit children that according to his plan of salvation, they would have to leave their heavenly home, take on human bodies, and be tested before they could progress to Godhood. Satan rejected this plan and wanted to implement one that would have involved loss of moral agency. Jesus opposed Satan, his brother, their brothers, Jesus and Lucifer are brothers. Jesus opposed that plan, uh, Satan's idea and offered an alternative plan in which he would take on human form and live a sinless life so that his spirit brothers and sisters could become gods. When this plan was not accepted, Lucifer got mad. He said he rebelled, and that's when he took the third part of the host of heaven with him 
to the earth to serve as tempters. Mormons do not define salvation or grace the way we do. They believe in universal salvation for everyone from death. That's what they see as salvation. And so when you speak to a Mormon, he says, I believe in salvation by grace alone, but he believes that's salvation just from physical death. But then if the body is re reunited with the spirit, they believe that humans go to different places as determined by the person's work and conduct in his life. They believe in a place called celestial glory, which is the highest level of, of the celestial heavenly kingdom. That is for married Mormons. It's only for those who are married and who have kept all the celestial laws and commandments. And this is what they refer to as eternal life. The lower celestial kingdom is for single more, uh, I was going to say morons, Mormons who lived a worthy life, uh, good people, including Christians, who didn't have a chance on earth to hear about and accept Mormonism. People in this lower group uh, cannot become gods. Then they believe in another place called terrestrial glory. They believe the terrestrial kingdom is for unworthy Mormons and good people who knew about Mormonism on earth but rejected it until after their death. Then they believe in what they call a telestial glory. Terrestrial and then telestial. The telestial realm is for wicked people who reject Mormonism even after death. They will experience suffering and pain for their sins. It's similar to the Christian version of hell, only it's not eternal. And then they believe in hell, which is outer darkness. They believe that eternal hell is only for Satan, for demons, and so-called sons of perdition, those who deny the Holy Spirit after receiving it. In addition to these major doctrines of the LDS Church, as I mentioned in part one, after the Book of Mormon was published in 1830, and the cult grew both in numbers and in wealth, holding Joseph Smith to be the true prophet of God, Smith's teachings again changed drastically and grew to be more and more satanic. He also developed a special priesthood for the LDS Church, somewhat like the uh, Roman Catholic priesthood, except that its liturgy and its temple rituals were copied and taken directly from the rituals of, and rites of occultic Freemasonry. And in the church today, as one writer observes, LDS temples play an integral part in the Mormon experience, hosting the religion's most sacred rituals and ordinances. Only members who have participated in multi-tier personal interview process with patriarchal leaders are granted permission to enter the temple ritual. Therein, Mormons are instructed that the knowledge, tokens, and signs obtained within the temple will provide passage through the veil into the kingdom of heaven. This is what they teach. I mean, it's masonry. And they call themselves Christians. Right. Some of the similarities between Mormonism and Masonry, specifically in the temple, include the all-seeing eye, the Masonic apron, uh, special hand grips, uh, five points of fellowship, special garments that are applied to initiates with very similar garment markings, Masonic symbology, including the star, the sun, and the moon symbols, along with the square and compass, beehive. They also, until 1990, administered and required Masonic blood and death oaths of secrecy with uh, gestures and words describing specific penalties agreed to if the secrets of the, of the temple ritual are revealed. And uh, these were also part of the temple ritual, but most of those were discontinued in 1990 when many of the members objected to them. Mormon temple ceremonies have changed over the years, but anyone who has experienced the LDS temple ritual will recognize the Masonic rituals are still there. In addition... The LDS Church still teaches the following doctrines today. That women need husbands for a resurrection at the end time. They believe that without a man to lift the veil over her face on resurrection day, she won't make it. She's, so she is desperate to see her husband remain a true Mormon so she may be resurrected. That's what they teach. So women's love has not made very good inroads in the Mormon church. They believe Jesus had many wives. They say Mary and Martha were among his wives. The sisters Mary and Martha. One Mormon authority said Jesus was killed for his polygamy. They believe in heaven, polygamy will be the rule. They still believe that today. In heaven, polygamy will be the rule. While early Mormon leaders taught and practiced polygamy, very few practice it today due to fear of arrest. However, they do still teach that men, men only, not women, will be polygamists in heaven. The Book of Mormon, they believe, is infallible, although it contradicts their current theology. The Mormon Articles of Faith say, we believe the Bible to be the Word of God as far as it is translated correctly. We also believe the Book of Mormon to be the Word of God. And they claim anything in the Bible which contradicts Mormon theology is incorrectly translated. They believe also that marriage 
is for eternity, as it is performed in Mormon temples. And so perhaps I suppose they consider the Bible's words mistranslated, where Jesus said in Matthew 22, verse 30, that in the resurrection, men neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Apparently they don't believe that's true. Or they perhaps believe that's mistranslated. As with uh, all of these places where Mormon doctrine is diametrically opposed to that of the Bible, I would really like for, for one Mormon to try to prove to me that the Bible was mistranslated at that verse, that in the resurrection men neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. They believe that uh, holy underwear has to be put on during the Mormon marriage ceremony, performed only in the temple, and these garments must always touch the body for the rest of their life. They believe this. This is supposed to keep the anointing oil of temple ceremony from escaping. Some Mormons irreverently call these their angel pants. <laughs> this is what they believe. <laughs> Baptism for the dead, they believe in that, is done to provide non-Mormon ancestors a place in celestial glory. Baptism for the dead is done. Mormons spend great sums of money on genealogical research. You've probably heard about that. They want to find their relatives who had no Mormon baptism, and they say no one can get to heaven without baptism, and heaven has no water, so they baptize living on behalf of the dead. They also believe in proxy marriage for the dead. Proxy marriage for the dead. That's performed in Mormon temples as well. Mormons believe that loved ones who died outside of Mormonism will live alone in the hereafter, and Mormons conduct proxy weddings so to seal these dead ones so that they can... Uh, have husbands and wives in heaven. So these are some of the many aberrant, satanic, devilish doctrines of the Mormon cult taught by Joseph Smith and Brigham Young. Brigham Young taught some others as well. And we know that in order to try to witness to an adherent of any false religion, we have to first address the authority, right, for what they believe. And so back momentarily to the Mormon doctrine of continual revelation. That new apostolic revelation is inspired, but not infallible, they believe. And it can supersede previous revelation, including that that's found in the scriptures. They can supersede their own scriptures. Personally, I'm quite sure this doctrine evolved out of necessity as it became clear that additional revelation was directly contradictory to previous doctrinal pronouncements, especially as was taught in the Book of Mormon. Many contradictions between the Book of Mormon and what's taught today. For instance, the Mormon doctrine today that there are many gods is directly contradicted in several passages in the Book of Mormon, specifically in Mosiah 15, verse 1 and verse 5, 2 Nephi 31, 21, and Alma 11, 28. So I'd encourage any Mormon listening to, to look those passages up. Common doctrine today of the Mormon church is that the Trinity is three separate gods. That was taught by James Talmadge with Articles of Faith. However, the Book of Mormon teaches that the Trinity is one God. It teaches a very biblical view of the Trinity. In Mosiah 15, verse 5, 2 Nephi 31, uh, 21, and Alma 11, 44. Alma 11, 44 speaks of a final judgment before the bar of Christ the Son and God the Father and the Holy Spirit, which is one eternal God. That's Trinity. So, obviously, uh, today's Mormon doctrine contradicts their infallible Book of Mormon. They believe today that God is increasing in knowledge. Joseph Smith taught that in his Journal of Discourses later in his apostasy. But the Book of Mormon teaches clearly that God does not change. God is unchanging. Mormon 9, verse 9 and 19, uh, Moroni 8, 18, and Alma 41, 8. And also Nephi 24, 6. All those passages teach that God is unchanging in the Book of Mormon. Except the Mormon doctrine today is that hell is not eternal, whereas the Book of Mormon did teach an eternal hell. Second 3, 11, 6, 10, Second Nephi 19, 16, etc. For many years, Mormon church did have the practice of polygamy. Brigham Young had, I think, 56 wives. Joseph Smith had 52. Brigham Young taught that Polygamy was required, actually, in his Journal of Discourses, Volume 3, page 266. However, in the Book of Mormon, polygamy is condemned. It's actually condemned in the Book of Mormon. Jacob 1.15, Jacob 2.23, 2.27, uh, Jacob 3.5, Mosiah 11.2, etc. 
Smith's first edition of Doctrine and Covenants, published in 1835, calls polygamy a crime of fornication. But this all changed later on. By 1844, Smith had concocted and promoted his doctrine that God was once a man and that all men can now become gods. And uh, by then he had also, to justify his many adulterous relationships, had met, by then he had married over 50 wives, some of whom were stolen, actually, from husbands to whom they were previously married. So all, they have all these contradictions between the Book of Mormon and what they believe today. And these many contradictions should cause problems, serious problems for Mormons today, I would think. I really believe that rather than seeing these many contradictions and differences in doctrine between the Book of Mormon, which Joseph Smith said was the most correct book of any on earth, and what today is held as fundamental Mormon doctrine, they should see these things rather than being the result of continual revelation, continuing revelation, progressive revelation. Every Mormon should instead see these contradictions as satanic confusion. Satanic confusion. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Amen. Furthermore, God's Word, the Bible, the King James Version of the Bible, says that God's Word and God's doctrine does not change. Amen. In the little book of Jude, Jude instructs us not to be open or receptive to new doctrines resulting from ongoing or progressive revelation, but instead to do what? To earnestly contend, right, for the faith once delivered unto the saints. Earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. That phrase, once delivered, means once and for all time. Amen. Our God, the true God of the Bible does not lie. He does not contradict himself, ever. He's always known all things. He's not learning anything new. There's nothing new to him, he says. In Malachi 3, verse 6, God says to every Mormon, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Allah changes. And the God of the Mormons changes. Who knows what's going to happen tomorrow? They could be condemned to hell tomorrow because some new president could come up and give them some new doctrine. They're all condemned to hell. God says, I'm the Lord. I change not. Therefore, you're not consumed. You can trust in my doctrine, God says. <laughs> Hallelujah. God is not the author of confusion. Every Mormon needs to see, therefore, that God is also not the author of the Book of Mormon, the Pearl of Great Price, or the Doctrine and Covenants of the LDS Church. And furthermore, every Mormon or member of the LDS Church needs to see that the source or the authority for most of these satanic doctrines that Joseph Smith developed later on that do contradict both the Book of Mormon and the Bible, that source being Joseph Smith's so-called Book of Abraham, as it is included within the pages of the Pearl of Great Price, has also been proven by undeniable physical and historical evidence to be a complete fraud and fabrication. Amen. And just one more of Joseph Smith's many very tall tales. In fact, actually, the undeniable fraud of the Book of Abraham is perhaps the most damaging and devastating challenge to the credibility of Mormonism that we can mention. In 1835, an Irishman named Michael Chandler brought an exhibit of four Egyptian mummies and a few papyri scrolls to Kirtland, Ohio, which was then the headquarters of the Mormons. Smith was allowed to view the scrolls, and upon examination, to everyone's shock, Smith revealed by the alleged power of God that one of the scrolls contained the writings of Abraham, and another the writings of Joseph of Egypt. Smith purchased the entire exhibit for $2,400, comparable to about $60,000 in our day today, and then over the following few years, undertook to translate so-called the book of Abraham from, hiero from the Egyptian hieroglyphics into King James English, while also producing three hand-drawn facsimiles or, or copies of the papyri that he included in the book of Abraham with his explanations of what they contained. He never actually finished translating the so-called book of Joseph. At that time, actually, very few people in the world were remotely qualified to even attempt to translate Egyptian writings. However, Smith's version was finally published in full in 1842, 
The book of Abraham was eventually canonized by the LDS Church in 1880 and placed in the Pearl Great Price collection. However, after Joseph Smith was killed by a mob at the Carthage, Illinois jail in 1844, Smith's first wife, Emma, and her family kept possession of the papyrus scrolls and then later sold them in 1856. The scrolls themselves were thought to have been destroyed in the Great Chicago Fire of 1871, but from Smith's facsimiles, as published in the Pearl Great Price, a non-Mormon Egyptologist beginning in the late 1800s challenged Smith's findings in his translation. In 1912, Arthur Mace, who was the assistant curator in the Department of Egyptian Art in New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art, wrote as follows about the Book of Abraham. He says, I return herewith, under separate cover, the Pearl of Great Price. The Book of Abraham, it is hardly necessary to say, is a pure fabrication. Cuts one and three are inaccurate copies of well-known scenes on funeral papyri. And cut two is a copy of one of the magical discs in which the late Egyptian period were placed under the heads of mummies. There were about 40 of these known in museums, and they are all very similar in character. Joseph Smith's interpretation of these cuts is a farrago of nonsense from beginning to end. Egyptian characters can now be read almost as easily as Greek, and five-minute study in an Egyptian gallery or any of any museum should be enough to convince any, any educated man of the clumsiness of the imposture. That was 1912. For a time, actually for decades, the LDS Church defended the book, saying that Smith's facsimiles were insufficient to prove the translation to be an error. But then in 1967, more than a century after they had been sold, the papyri were discovered to have been fully preserved in the New York Metropolitan Museum of Art. And they were closely matching the, fac the facsimiles that Smith had produced. And though some Mormons had tried to deny they were from the same scrolls, there is in fact no doubt that the recovered papyri are portions of Smith's original purchase since they were actually pasted onto paper uh, containing drawings of an LDS temple on the back and maps of the Kirtland, Ohio area. They were also accompanied by an affidavit from Joseph Smith's first wife, Emma, stating that they had been in Smith's possession. And so they're definitely the original papyri. After the scrolls were recovered, trained Egyptologists in the late 1960s and early 1970s examined them to see if Smith had translated the text correctly. As we expect, of course, the text which Smith had used showed no similarity to what he had published as the Book of Abraham. In fact, the findings confirmed exactly what Arthur Mace had said in 1912 when it was determined that they were, in fact, Egyptian burial manuals written hundreds of years after the time of Abraham and nowhere even containing Abraham's name. A University of Chicago Egyptologist named Robert Rittner concluded in 2014 that the source of the Book of Abraham is the breathing permit of Hor, misunderstood and mistranslated by Joseph Smith, and that the other papyri are common Egyptian funerary documents like the Book of the Dead. So all of this, of course, proves beyond any reasonable doubt that the book of Abraham is a complete fraud from start to finish. And so I therefore come back to the quote by Joseph Fielding Smith, president of the LDS Church in the early 1970s, who surely had to know all these things. He had to know all these things, and yet he still stated as follows, as recorded in Doctrines and Salvation, Volume 1, pages 188 to 189, quote, Mormonism must stand or fall on the story of Joseph Smith. He was either a prophet of God, divinely called, properly appointed and commissioned, or he was one of the biggest frauds the world has ever seen. There is no middle ground. If Joseph was a deceiver who willfully attempted to mislead people, then he should be exposed, his claims should be refuted, and his doctrines shown to be false. Once again, our God never asked anyone to put his brain on the shelf. He says, come now. And let us reason together, saith the Lord. And based on the evidence seen so far, it's most reasonable to conclude that if Mormonism stands or falls on the story of Joseph Smith, then we must conclude that it falls. Amen. Now, as stated, the book of Abraham is a complete fraud from start to finish. And this is the source. This is the source or the authority for the majority of the satanic doctrines that Joseph Smith later developed and that contradict both the Book of Mormon and the Bible. 
which includes within this within the book of, of Abraham, includes qualifications for and the nature of the Mormon priesthood, the temple rituals, the plurality of God's doctrine, a premortal human existence and intelligence, the exaltation and deification of man, the so-called first and second uh, estates that they believe in, the whole nature of the cosmos, identifying the slowest rotating star or planet that Smith named Kolob, which he said was close to the star to where God lives. That's all in this, it's all in this book of Abraham. All of these abominable, aberrant doctrines were concocted inventions of Joseph Smith, or actually, in fact, of course, of Satan the devil himself, the being to whom Joseph Smith sold his very soul, and for whom Joseph Smith taught the very same lie that Satan deceived Eve with in the Garden of Eden, that men can be as gods. And all of these, all of these abominable, aberrant, and bizarre doctrines are flatly condemned in the true scriptures, the King James Bible, to which the LDS Church gives lip service only. But that I would recommend that every Mormon hearing this message online pick up, start reading, and adopt as your sole authority for Christian doctrine and practice. Amen. And through which you can come to know the true Lord Jesus Christ, true salvation from your sin, and true eternal life. God's Word, the Bible, says that, first of all, that the office of the apostle was foundational to the church and that true apostles had to have seen the risen Lord, meaning that there are no true apostles living today. But a, a true apostle of the Lord Jesus, the Apostle John, said this in 1 John chapter 5, verse 20. 1 John 5, verse 20. And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true, and we are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Jesus Christ, John says, is the true God and eternal life. To know Him is to know eternal life. God's Word, the Bible, condemns Mormonism, condemns its plurality of God's doctrine, and says in multiple passages that there is only one God. Isaiah 43, we covered this before. Isaiah 43, God says through the prophet Isaiah, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. Verse 11, God says, I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Amen. That's Jesus talking there. Isaiah 44, next chapter over. Verse 6. The true God says, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. And beside me there is no God. By the way, we know from Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, 11, and 17 that this is the Lord Jesus Christ speaking here. He says the same thing there. I am the first, I am the last. We read in verse 8, Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. He says, is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. Over uh, a couple more chapters. Isaiah 46. Isaiah 46, verse 9. The true God of the true Bible, the true Word of God, says in Isaiah 46, verse 9, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Amen. Over and over, the Bible says there is only one God. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, the Apostle Paul says in verse 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, he says, As concerning therefore the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice to idols, Paul says, We know that an idol is nothing in the world. Paul says, And that there is none other God but one. Paul says, There's no, no God but one God. Idols are nothing. There's only one God, Paul says. Isaiah chapter 48. Go back there. The Bible reveals that there's only one God. At the same time, we also know that the Bible reveals this one God as a triune being that includes three distinct persons in one Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. With which, and as stated, the Book of Mormon actually agrees in several places. We talked about that, how the Book of Mormon actually teaches the Trinity. The Bible reveals this one God is a triune being that includes three distinct persons in one Godhead, all three of whom, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, each of whom possesses all the divine attributes of deity, of omniscience, 
of omnipotence, of omnipresence, that no other being in the universe ever did or ever will possess. And to state this doctrine clearly, the Trinity, because the Bible teaches first that there is only one true God, and secondly that there are three distinct persons in the Bible who are each referred to as being God, therefore we must conclude that God is a triune being. There is a three-in-oneness within the Godhead. We see that one true God existing as a trinity, both in the Old and New Testaments, not only in the New, in the New Testament, such as in Matthew 28, where we know we are commanded to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Also in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14, where the Apostle Paul says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. There's a trinity there. And also in 1 John 5, 7, we know where John says, For there are three that bear a record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. The Trinity is not just a New, a New Testament concept, however. We see the Trinity in the Old Testament as well. God has always, from eternity past, existed as a Trinity and has revealed Himself as such. Just as He revealed Himself to Isaiah, here in Isaiah chapter 48. Isaiah 48, verse 12. We read, Hearken unto me, O Jacob, and Israel my called. I am he, I am the first, I also am the last. Who is that talking? That's Jesus, we do know again. And comparing this verse with Revelation chapter 1, Jesus is talking here, the beginning and the ending, the first and the last. And here in Isaiah 48, he says in verse 13, Mine hand also hath laid the foundation of the earth, and my right hand hath spanned the heavens. When I call unto them, they stand up together. But by the way, when Jesus said, peace be still, he called the raging sea, did he not? This verse says, just as John says in John 1, verse 3, John says, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Jesus is the creator God. As Paul states also in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 through 17, for by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Jesus is the creator of God. So here in Isaiah 48, look down in verse 16. This is Jesus talking. But down in verse 16, Jesus says this, Come ye near unto me, hear ye this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. From the time that it was, there am I. And now the Lord God and His Spirit has sent me. There is a trinity in the Old Testament right there in that verse. The Lord God and His Spirit has sent me, says Jesus. Here we have what must be seen as a clear presentation and a revelation of the trinity given to Isaiah. All through the Bible, we see three separate persons united into one Godhead. God's Word, the Bible, condemns Mormonism's plurality of God's doctrine and says there is only one God who has always, from eternity past, existed as a triune being, a trinity. The entire religion of Mormonism is predicated on Joseph Smith's claim that all Christian sects of his day had apostatized from the true Christian faith, that the King James Bible had been corrupted and is not a faithful translation of God's true word, and that he was chosen to restore the true Christian faith. To the contrary, however, not only has Joseph Smith now been proven to be a fraud, a liar, and a charlatan, but we also know that God's true word, the Bible, has been proven over and over to be true, both historically and archaeologically. It is indeed true that the Christian faith of the apostles became in large part corrupted uh, by the rise of Roman Catholicism, but that's because the Catholic cult, of course, departed from the teachings of the scriptures that Christ's apostles left to us. However, because the Lord Jesus promised that though heaven and earth shall pass away, his words would never pass away, as God promised over and over to preserve the words that he initially moved his prophets and apostles to write. He moved, for instance, the psalmist to write in Psalm 12, 6 through 7. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in the furnace of earth purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. God promised to preserve his words, as God also moved the Old Testament prophet Isaiah to write, as quoted by the Apostle Peter. 
that the grass withereth, the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. In keeping these promises, the one true God saw to it that his New Testament scriptures were preserved for the early Waldensian and other nonconformist Christians who refused to apostatize with the Roman Catholic cult, so that by the middle of the second century AD, the New Testament Greek text, as received by the early church, was also translated from the Greek into the old uh, Roman Latin to confirm and to preserve the proper wording of the New Testament text until it was faithfully translated and incorporated into the Textus Receptus uh, so it could be then faithfully translated into English by the King James Bible translators. Furthermore, in addition to archaeological support, the Dead Sea Scrolls and uh, the Hebrew and Jewish confirmation of the Masoretic Old Testament text, we also have thousands of quotes in the New Testament made by several early Christian writers confirming almost every verse of the New Testament. However, in all the annals of early Christian history, there is not one Christian writer that in any way confirms the satanic doctrines of devils that were espoused by Joseph Smith in today's LDS Church. To the contrary, however, one of the earliest of those Christian writers was Ignatius, a contemporary of Polycarp. He was a student of the Apostle John, bishop of the church in Antioch, who was martyred at Rome in about 140 A.D. Ignatius. And contrary to Joseph Smith's satanic doctrine that God was once a man and that all men can become gods, in his letter to the Magnesians, Ignatius stated as follows, first, actually quoting from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 4. He says, Be not deceived with strange doctrines, nor with old fables which are unprofitable. For if we still live according to the Jewish law, we acknowledge that we have not received grace. For the divinest prophets lived according to Christ Jesus. On this account, writes Ignatius, also they were persecuted, being inspired by his grace, to fully convince the unbelieving that there is one God who has manifested himself by Jesus Christ his Son, who is his eternal word, not spoken, but essential. Ignatius says, there is one God who has manifested himself by Jesus Christ, his son. Then on his way to Rome to be martyred, Ignatius wrote as follows about having been sentenced actually to death by Emperor Trajan. He writes, Trajan said, do we not then seem to you to have the gods in our mind whose assistance we enjoy in fighting against our enemies? To which Ignatius answered, Thou art in error when thou callest the demons of the nations gods. For there is but one God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that are in them, and one Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, whose kingdom may I enjoy. All the early writers confirm that there's only one God. Another early Christian writer, Irenaeus, who was a student of Polycarp in chapter 3 of his great work against heresies, he wrote to condemn such heretics as Joseph Smith, saying of such men, and others of them with great craftiness adapted such parts of Scripture to their own figments, led away captive from the truth, those who do not retain a steadfast faith in one God, the Father Almighty, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. One more of many such examples we could cite is a quote from Justin Martyr, another student of Polycarp, who said in his discourse with Trypho, a Jew, There will be no other God, O Trypho, nor was there from eternity any other existing. But he who made and disposed all this universe. Nor do we think that there is one God for us, another for you, but that he alone is God who led, our, who led your fathers out from Egypt with a strong hand and high arm. Nor have we trusted in any other, for there is no other, but in him in whom you also have trusted, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. Just a martyr. God's word, the Bible, also tells us very plainly in 2 Peter chapter 1 where his true word, the true scriptures, have come from. And it doesn't come from Egyptian papyri deciphered through some strange prophetic gift of discerning Egyptian hieroglyphics, as Joseph Smith claimed. And it doesn't come from buried golden plates that have to be deciphered and translated using methods and tools of divination that are condemned in scripture, by the way, as Joseph Smith both claimed and employed. Christ's true apostle Peter who witnessed Christ's glorious transfiguration on that holy mount when he heard the Father speak from heaven concerning his beloved Son, the Lord Jesus. And he speaks of that blessed event here in 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. Peter writes, verse 16, 
For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. But then, even having heard the Father's voice from heaven, in the very next verse, Peter then says that we have something better in God's preserved written word. Amen. He says, verse 19, we also have a more sure, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Where until ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts. Peter says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That is the true source of divinely inspired scripture. Amen. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And what we now know Joseph Smith to have been, a lying, cheating, wife-stealing, adulterous fraud, and con artist who practiced the magic arts and occultic Freemasonry, was anything but a holy man of God. Every Mormon or every LDS church member needs to see that Joseph Smith's doctrine that men can be as gods is an abominable and a devilish lie that came straight from the pit of hell. And all those that hold to that doctrine will one day be condemned as idolaters. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5, For this you know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Paul says, Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. God's true word, the Bible, says no mortal, Mormon or otherwise, will ever become any kind of God. Isaiah 43, we read it. You are my witnesses, saith the Lord, verse 10, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. Amen. That says no mortal, Mormon or otherwise, will ever become any kind of God. And every Mormon or every LDS church member must repent of this blasphemous idolatry of Joseph Smith and his LDS church before it is eternally too late. And he finds himself right along with Lucifer the devil cast into that lake of fire where the Lord Jesus said, Their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. To any Mormon who may be hearing this message, if he or she is still listening, you need to understand that the Jesus of the LDS church is a counterfeit. Not at all the Jesus of the Bible. And he therefore provides no salvation from sin or eternal life, as does the true Jesus. We read in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21 to 23, that a real angel sent by God, not by Lucifer, appeared to Joseph, the husband of Mary, saying of Mary, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Then Matthew says in verse 22, Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be the child, a virgin shall be the child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted as God with us. The Bible says that Mary was a virgin when she conceived Jesus. Jesus was and is a fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 7. We also read in the real Bible, the King James Version, Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 through 11, that Jesus, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. We know the passage. And took upon himself the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. That passage says that Jesus was already God before he willingly humbled himself to take on human flesh. He wasn't a man first who became God later. The exact opposite. The Bible says 
Jesus was already God before He willingly humbled Himself to take on human flesh to become Emmanuel, God with us, so that He could then go to the cross to bear the full penalty for all mankind's sin. However, rather than being Emmanuel, or God with us, as the Bible says, and who then took on human flesh and became a man in order to be our Redeemer and our Savior, the Jesus of the LDS Church is a mere created being who also had to be redeemed. Rather than being born of a virgin, conceived of the Holy Ghost, as the Bible clearly teaches, the counterfeit Jesus of the LDS Church was sired by Adam, who as an exalted resurrected being came to Mary and physically fathered Jesus. That's what Brigham Young taught. Thus, the Mary of the LDS Church was not a virgin who brought forth a son, as the Bible teaches, but was the physically impregnated wife of the Heavenly Father, whom Brigham Young declared to be Adam. Brigham Young taught that Jesus was a spirit child of Adam, and that he was a spirit brother of all humankind, as well as brother of angels, spirit beings, and fallen ones. Jesus was a brother of Lucifer. Whereas the Bible teaches that Jesus was and is the eternal Son of God, who created all things, including Lucifer and all the angels. We read in John chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. I would like to challenge any Mormon to tell me how that passage was mistranslated or corrupted over the years. How is the promise that Mary would be a virgin to give birth to a child? How is that mistranslated? We read in Colossians chapter 1 also. Paul says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, for by him were all things created. All things were created by Jesus, Paul says, that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things, Paul says, were made by him and for him. Paul says he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Jesus was the eternal God long before he humbled himself willingly to become a man to go to the cross for us. And he did that because only God in human flesh could atone for the sins of all mankind throughout all ages. He had to be God in human flesh to do that. And every Mormon must understand who the real Jesus is to be saved. And also that his own good works are seen as filthy rags and will not ever be sufficient to get him into Christ's true celestial kingdom. It's not going to happen. We read in Titus chapter 3, verse 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. That being justified, Paul says, by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Paul says that we have been justified by God's grace. We haven't just been saved from death. We have been declared righteous. Our sins are gone. We have been declared righteous because of what Jesus did for us. And my prayer is that God will somehow use this weak message to save that Mormon today who stands in the very danger of eternal damnation and to wake him up to the fact that he must repent of having believed the lies of Joseph Smith and the Mormon cult and to, by faith, receive the real Lord Jesus of the Bible as a Savior and Lord. I'm going to end the message on that note. Let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I just uh, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth of your word, for the reliability, for the inerrancy and trustworthiness of your infallible word. I pray that you'd wake up some Mormons today, Lord. I pray that you'd use us, help us to know how to reach out to Mormons and uh, those that we know, those that we meet with the gospel of salvation. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.